It's a good day. The Lord has made it, everything in it, and we get to enjoy it. One of the comments that I regularly hear in my household is that we don't talk enough about heaven. So this morning, we're going to talk about heaven and our confidence of getting there and looking a bit at its basis and maybe uh, exhorting one another a little. So I got a question for you. And that question is, when you get to heaven, who would you like to talk to apart from Jesus? That, that's, that's a given, okay. <laughs> who would you like to talk to and why? And while you're thinking about that, I'll tell you who I'd like to talk to and why. So when I get to heaven, I'd like to talk to Abigail. Do you know Abigail? One of, one of the wives of David? Because she's intelligent, she's beautiful, and she seriously impressed me with the gracefulness and wisdom with which she handled a difficult situation. So I think I'd be really blessed sitting down and just listening to what that gracious lady uh, from 3,000 years ago uh, hear what she might have to say. So that's, that's my little uh, looking forward to. So how about you? The Queen. The Queen. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because she's, because she's beautiful. Wouldn't disagree with that. Excellent. Someone else. My father, because before he died, the last thing I said to him is, I hate you. Okay. Unfinished business. <laughs> um, I'm not restricting this to biblical characters. Anyone from history, family, whatever? If he's there, I'd like to meet Mozart. I just want to know what made him tick. How... I love that comment, if he's there. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to talk to everyone who's there. I think um, if you're there, you're interesting and, yeah, you're worth talking to. Anyone else? Oh, Carol. Yeah. I'd like to speak to Joshua. Um, because the older I've got, I've named my son after Joshua, um, but um, his character and the older I get, I, I feel that like I am like Joshua. So like when they were, um, when they went in to see, look at the promised land, what was promised to them, like Joshua said, which is me, everybody, this is the land that the Lord has promised us. Come on, let's go, guys. Let's go and take it. But Caleb said, hang on a minute. If this is the land that the Lord has promised, he will give it into our hands. So I would just like to say um, I feel that spirit of Joshua in me is like, if the Lord says, that's for me, I'm taking it, I'm having it. Anna. Like Miriam, I think I love to talk to everybody. But first of all, I would like to talk to Paul. I would like to know what made him tick before the Damascus experience and what actually spoiled him on after the Damascus experience. Oh. I would want to speak to Solomon. Um, I'm kind of curious about his wisdom, but I'm also kind of curious about why a person with such wisdom yet still was kind of tricked and veered off left, right. Yeah, lots of unanswered questions. Um, the Bible tells us everything we need to know, not necessarily everything we want to know. <laughs> Let me come to Barry. Yeah, I'd like to have a one-to-one -one with Samson. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really like to know, you know, why he has ignored all the signs 
of um, deceitfulness and still, you know, gave in to this woman. So I'd like to know. Fabulous. So we've all got uh, our heroes, our unanswered business. I'd like to speak to, um, to David, how he stopped the mouse of lion, because there's loads of lion I'd like to stop. <laughs> I'm getting exercise this morning. I was going to say Abigail, but you said that, but I would still like to speak to her. But I'd like to speak to Moses as well, and all the frustrations he must have gone through yeah. when he dealt with that. Wow. We're going to be busy up there, aren't we? We've got quite a few, few questions. Okay. There, there, there's at least one other person that I'd like to speak to when I get up there. You. <laughs> well, I'm interested, you know, to, to a degree, I've shared a little bit of my life with you. We've, we've walked parallel paths for a short distance. Uh, and if I have to say goodbye tomorrow, I want to know how things panned out for you. And I, I kind of hope some of you might be interested in how it panned out for me as well. <laughs> I'd, I'd also like to visit some of those people that I've met in the past and I'm really not sure. I really don't know where they stand. I'd like to know whether they made it or not. I'd also like to meet some people who were um, instrumental in me coming to faith but who never knew that I did come to faith because I owe them a big de debt of gratitude I want to say thank you. I also want to say sorry. <laughs> uh, I was not a great non-Christian. I didn't do that very well. <laughs> so I'm also expecting that for some people that I've left behind in my past, and I'm absolutely sure they're not Christians, that between me saying goodbye to them uh, and the end of their life, that the Lord will have spoken to them, met them, and maybe led them to the Lord. I I'm expecting to be surprised. I'm expecting to meet a few scoundrels from my past who somehow or other, by the grace of God, ended up in heaven. I'm expecting to be delighted at the sorts of stories that I hear from those unexpected faces up there. And also, with great regret, I'm probably going to be surprised and shocked by a few absentees, realistically. I have no idea who they are, but maybe a few, there'll be some absentees. So thinking of Abigail and thinking of the friends that I've known over the years, am I sure that they will be there? And my answer is, well, I'm pretty sure. With Abigail, I'm 99.9% .9 sure. <laughs> but I'm not 100% certain. There's someone who I am 100% certain won't be there and that's Judas, because the scriptures expressly tell us that. Um, Matthew uh, records Jesus saying it would be better if he'd never been born, which makes no sense if he arrives in heaven. Um, and uh, in Acts, there's a euphemism saying that he went to the place where he belongs, which is understood to be hell. So we're not going to see Judas there. That we can be sure. But who will be there and how can we be sure? Jesus told us a parable. So this is a very good place to um, start answering the question. This is in Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was sleeping, 
his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed ears, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Jesus told that parable to the crowds. A little later, he explained it to his disciples. The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will be thrown into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has an ear, let them hear. So among the 12 disciples, there was a weed. (laughs) And his name was? Okay, that was too easy. So... Among the first church in Acts 5, who possibly were the weeds? They were? Uh Aha, well, if I tell you that, I told you the answer. (laughs) It's the account of Ananias and Sapphira who revealed by their actions that their hearts weren't right, and at least possibly were weeds. How about the seven of Acts 6? You've got seven names, starting with Stephen. What about some of those? There's a clue in the list of the 12 disciples, because if you'll notice... The most honored of the disciples, Peter, his name appears first on the list, and the least honored, Judas, appears last. So if you're going to look for a candidate for a weed in the seven, it's going to be the last one. His name was Nicholas of Antioch, uh, and there is a tradition that he was behind the sect of the Nicolaitans referred to in Revelation, and that he'd gone astray. Can't be sure, but that's a tradition that exists. So possibly Nicholas. How about among the Samaritan converts of Philip in Acts 8? Who's cheating by looking? (laughs) Acts 8, the Samaritan believers, converts of the evangelist Philip. Who was the, who was the weed? Do you have him? Simon the sorcerer. Uh, the account might leave you in some doubt as to whether he was a weed, but it would have been well known to uh, Luke's readers that Simon became a devoted um, disruptor and opponent of the Apostle Peter, uh, particularly in his ministry in Rome. 
Simon would eventually boast to his followers that if they buried him, he would rise from the dead three days later. They did, and he didn't. <laughs> that was the end of Simon. The Ephesian church, after Paul had left, in Acts 20, Paul warns about no names, but he warns about savage wolves that would enter the congregation and tear it apart. Weeds in Ephesus. How about Paul's co-workers? Yep, there's even a candidate for a weed among Paul's co-workers. Are you going to be bold enough to tell us, Hannah? Here's the mic. I don't want to. I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh, I think that was cowardice. <laughs> In 2 Timothy, Paul talks about Demas, who, because he loved the world, had deserted Paul and is a candidate uh, for a weed even among Paul's co-workers. How about GBC today? You don't know, I don't know, draw a line under it. <laughs> Please, no pointing of fingers. However, you know, realistically, since they're always present, it's absurd to suggest they're not present here. Within the church, some people are masquerading. They've got on a Christian mask, but their hearts are not devoted to the Lord. We don't know who they are. Nobody knows who's who they are. The fact is, we cannot be 100% sure of anybody else's salvation because it has to do with the condition of their heart, and we can't see people's hearts. In the fullness of time, heart attitude is usually revealed by that person's actions. So, you know, you think of Judas and Annas and Sapphira, you think of Demas, their actions would eventually betray the wrongness of their hearts. It's worth considering also that before Judas's betrayal, the 11 had no idea. I suspect, knowing human capacity for self-deception, that even Judas didn't know. I imagine as he stole money from the common purse, he was telling himself, I'm only borrowing it, or something along those lines. So, we can't be sure 100% who is saved, but neither can we be sure about who is definitely not saved. Somebody rather wisely said years ago, who knows the transactions that go on between a man and his God on his deathbed? There may well be people up there that live a life utterly alienated from God who at the very last moment turn and you'll meet them. So even when all the evidence says these people are scoundrels, they're never going to heaven, you might meet them because we have a God who's incredibly gracious and even if somebody turns at the very last moment of their life, like the repentant thief on the cross beside Jesus, they are acceptable. Jesus makes it very clear in the parable that no attempt should be made to weed out those weeds. Because we don't know who they are, if, if, if we decided that we're going to weed out Demas from Paul's co-workers, then on the same criteria, we would probably have weeded out John Mark, 
who also deserted Paul at one stage. And if we'd have thrown him out of the church, that would have been something of a disaster because we'd have lost Mark's gospel. <laughs> so there's the enormous capacity for mis making mistakes. Indeed, I can personally speak as someone who has been weeded out of a church, and I can tell you it's unpleasant and miserable. It causes a lot of grief for a considerable period of time. Let's not go there. On the positive side, although we can't be 100% sure of anybody else, we can be 100% sure of our own salvation and destiny. We can possess 100% assurance that we're going to heaven. So I'm going to unpack some of that assurance this morning. Our assurance is built on three different, though related, foundations. And I suspect that each of them is sufficient in itself. Each is adequate to lead you to full confidence. But in the generosity of God, he's provided you with three times more than you need because he wants you to be absolutely confident in the inheritance that you're to receive at the end of your days. So let's have a look at those three grounds. Grounds for confidence, grounds for assurance. The first grounds for our confidence are the scriptures. The scriptures reveal the character of God and transmit to us his immutable, that's unchangeable promises to us who believe. They reveal an all-powerful, utterly faithful, steadfast Lord God. And this God, with absolute integrity and absolute authority and absolute power, has declared through his servants that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's quoted by Paul, quoted by Peter, originally by the prophet Joel. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the promise of God. Paul would say, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There are others, but I haven't got hours and hours. <laughs> but there are the cast iron guaranteed promises of God through his servants. If you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Based on the character of God and his expressed promises, we have grounds for confidence, grounds for assurance. Now, I want to cross a theological I and dot a theological T <laughs> or, or even the other way around. <laughs> okay. These, these promises, they assume some things. They assume that the words of our mouths are an accurate expression of the attitude of our hearts. Okay? Um, if saying Jesus is Lord is just saying it and it's actually a lie... That doesn't get you anywhere at all. It's assuming that the expression of our mouths is an accurate expression of the attitude and condition of our hearts. That's the first theological tweak. <laughs> the second one is this. Furthermore, we need to appreciate that uh, when, when the scripture talks about Jesus, 
we mean the person revealed under that name in the Scriptures. Not some uh, lesser person of our imagination. Not merely a good moral teacher, a prophet, or a mythical figure. But we're talking about the second person of the triune Godhead, co-equal, co-eternal with the Father, fully human, fully divine, very God from very God, who died and rose again, is now in glory, soon to return as judge of all. That's the Jesus that is being referred to. You can't replace it with another one and expect the promise to stand. Okay? You can call someone other than the biblical Jesus Savior, but following him won't get you to heaven. Okay? So don't go for any fabrications devised by clever men or women. <laughs> Only the revelation in Scripture will get you there. I made a promise on Wednesday to a cat, so here's me fulfilling my promise, okay? I say, you can call your cat Moses, but following him won't get you to the promised land. <laughs> so, Moses has his promise fulfilled. Um, John, Batham, and Anne, their cat's name is Moses, in case you hadn't realized. <laughs> so that's your first grounds the scriptures. The second grounds is the internal witness of the Spirit. The Spirit witnesses with our spirit and we cry, Abba, Father. My usual form of address to God when I'm praying is Father. And it seems to me that by his Spirit, his normal form of address to me is my son. Not just son, but my son. There's a, a possessiveness to it. He's purchased me. He owns me. The Spirit guarantees our inheritance, which includes heaven. It's more than heaven, but it includes heaven. Uh, uh, an awareness of an indwelling person with you as you walk your life is also a testimony to the certainty of you arriving in heaven. That's the second grounds. The third grounds for our confidence. And this is, well, if you only just become a Christian, this will not be too big. But if you've been a Christian any length of time, this is major. Okay. And that is our personal history of our walk with God. It's all those answered prayers. It's all that uh, wisdom and strength we've received for facing life's challenges and fulfilling the good works that he's prepared in advance for us to do. It's a memory of all those God incidences when he brings people across our path in unlikely circumstances. It's a memory of looking back over a period of time and we didn't see God do it, but we know that we were different at the end of that period than we were at the beginning to his glory. How he did it, we're not sure, but we can see his hand at work in our lives. We remember the anointing. That's amazing. When you say something to somebody and they go, wow, that really ministered to me. If you haven't experienced that, you must. It has you punching the air with joy, I tell you. Uh, how about all the guidance you've received over the years? Uh, this is probably isn't an exhaustive list because God relates to us in such a multitude of ways. But if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you've got this testimony, this built-up capital in the bank of all God's dealings with you. 
And that also provides you with increased confidence. Each of these three grounds, the scriptures, the spirit, and our own personal history, may be regarded as adequate grounds for having the certainty of heaven to come. However, taken collectively, they provide you with a superabundance of grounds. And if a superabundance of grounds is available, why settle for the merely adequate? If your confidence in your final destination is scripture-based, hallelujah, but know also that an experience of the Spirit is part of your new birthright. Pray in faith. Get someone to pray with you to receive that additional dimension to your Christian experience. For some Christians, their confidence is Holy Spirit-based. They're very aware of God walking with them day by day. They're very aware of his presence. But why not add to that uh, presence and knowledge the objective testimony of Scripture to further strengthen your confidence? Okay. See if Chris can help me. Can you complete this series of five? Pray, read. No? Okay. This, this is a plug for the beta course later on in the year. Um, pray, read, observe, interpret, apply. Okay. This is about becoming skilled in handling the scriptures. The better you handle them, the more you understand them, the greater your confidence. So if you're a Holy Spirit-based confidence person, then add to that confidence a confidence that comes from the Scriptures. And whether your confidence is Scripture-based or Spirit-based or a balance of both, let's add to that confidence the additional confidence that comes from a faithful walk. If none of these grounds of confidence are present, see Warren tomorrow. Oh, okay. <laughs> if there's a long queue, I'm in trouble. <laughs> if there's a short queue, I'm sure he'll be content. So, when we meet in heaven, because I'm 99% percent sure I'll be meeting you. Whether it's me that finds you or you that finds me, incidentally, um, don't expect it soon after I arrive. I'm likely to be preoccupied with other things. <laughs> it may take a few million years before my thoughts finally have room for anything other than Jesus. Uh, and, I, and I come and find you or you come and find me. What I'd like you to do is to come heavy laden. Heavy laden with stories of how the Lord has answered your prayers, used you to change your environment, used you to extend his kingdom, used you to bring glory to Jesus. So that by walking daily with the Lord and seeking to minister in a hurting world, between now and that meeting in heaven, you may acquire story after story of his faithfulness and goodness to you and through you. Because I'd like to hear them. And here's my part of the bargain. I'll do the same. I'll seek between now and my heavenly journey to walk daily with the Lord, seek to minister in a hurting world 
and know his grace in me and through me. So, that's my offer. Do we have a deal? Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.